The world is a tantalizing fruit ripe for exploit. Industrialization and exploitation are the main themes of Victoria 3, both of which are expedited by conquest. In honest terms, conquest isn't very important for most of the great and major powers of the game. Whatever natural resources a country doesn't have can easily be traded for or acquired through peaceful colonization. It's only when greed reaches new heights that even economic beasts like France or Britain seek conquest. That's of course if you want to play Victoria 3 the way it was intended. The game itself doesn't necessarily have to slot so nicely into the niche of just industrialization and exploitation. Playing as France invites immense opportunity for conquest thanks to their top of the line military. Your only limit is of course the infamy system and naval competition with Britain. What if I told you that France can easily kick Britain to the curb and overtake their only competitor on the very first day and do it for zero infamy, later moving on to face the entire world and conquer all of it in the name of the French Empire? This is a guide for France in the new 1.4 Victoria 3 patch. I haven't played the 1.5 beta patch yet, so any strategies here have an unknown effectiveness in the beta, use at your own risk. Let's get into it. First off, I'm changing my game rules slightly to make this a bit easier on myself. To be clear, it won't be much easier, but just a little bit. I'm setting the AI aggression to high since I want the AI to conquer more nations and consolidate more. I've also put pop consolidation to aggressive because of performance issues. As the rule says, it does affect balance, but not in any honestly meaningful way. You'll see later exactly how much this game chugs when you attempt a world conquest. Patch 1.4 has improved performance quite a bit, so it was nice but it's still a hellscape by the 1900s. Anyway, it's day one in game, and we begin by queuing up some construction sectors, which now use up two infrastructure apiece, followed by iron mines where we can put them. We need a ton of iron, and eventually coal too. Next, queue up military techs up to breach loading artillery so we can get better artillery to get an advantage over our opponents. With all that done, declare a war for the home counties on Britain, and add some hefty war goals. I'll be transferring the East India Company, which is already over 100 infamy, I'm also going to conquer the Midlands and Yorkshire since they provide a ton of coal and iron to Britain, which I'd rather I get to use. After assigning the war goals, I went and added some consumption taxes, got generals hired, and unpaused. So you might be a bit worried about your infamy at this point, and rightly so, but we have a useful card up our sleeve that will come into play soon. Go ahead and support the Bonapartists, but honestly it doesn't matter much who you support. Louis Napoleon is just a really popular emperor, so he tends to be a good choice. The war will break out relatively soon, and because we declared on day one, we were able to do so before any other powers could declare interests in Britain. For that reason, no one can join the war except the Netherlands. This is important because, although France is strong, it's not strong enough to defeat all the great powers. But in a 1v1 against Britain, we win. Well, we win on the ground, but the navy is another question. Thankfully, the underdeveloped systems for war in this game and we can just abuse fronts to win. Send in as many naval invasions as you can to London, staggering each invasion by one day so they don't arrive at the same time. An important note here is to make sure you have a general garrison in the France HQ at all times, because Britain will attempt to, and succeed often, in naval invading Picardy over and over. Because they can't beat you on the ground, their naval invasion will usually die when attempting to land, but if there are no generals in the HQ keeping it safe, they can land for free and instantly make it to Paris. Wait some time for your naval invasions to go through, and you'll notice that with each invasion, the number of defending troops gets smaller and smaller. This is because a general can only fight one battle at a time, so we just overwhelm the English HQ with armies. It might take a few tries if you get unlucky with how other armies split, but in my case I got a solid 45 on 5 battalion fight, which let me occupy London. This is also where the card up my sleeve will come into play. My infamy is well over 100, and it'll take decades for it to go back down. So what do we do? Well, someone is going to cut us down, and there's a very important thing to remember while getting cut down. And that's that it basically undoes any conquest you've done in the past 10 years, and in return removes all infamy from your country. Well, it's still 1836, and I have conquered exactly nothing. But I sure do have a ton of infamy to get rid of, so I'm just going to immediately back down to Prussia's demand to cut me down. Nothing was lost from this, except my infamy, which is now zero. As the war is ongoing, you should have enough iron mines. The next thing we need are engines and steel, since without engines we can't get railways, and we'll certainly need those to industrialize massively enough to dominate our enemies. Anyway, focusing back on Britain, we've got our beachhead, so we just set up all the units in defense mode there and wait. If Britain ends up being able to push you back and off the island, just reinvade until you win. I capitulated Britain in November of 1837, and I did have some difficulties needing to reinvade here or there, but ultimately I came out on top, bifurcating Britain proper and stealing away India. If Britain's capital ends up in Lancashire, they get renamed to Greater Manchester, in case you didn't know, so that's kind of funny. From here, we have to consider how the world conquest will work. We need to conquer everyone in as few diplomatic plays as possible, and we need to cut off great powers from their expansion routes. 
We can pop it any minor power, and popping is a much faster way to conquer since it uses fewer diplomatic plays. The focus on number of plays is because each play takes 100 days minimum, and given that every war will always take at least 2 or 3 months, the actual amount of time in the game is only barely enough. This doesn't even account for how much longer it can take to win protracted wars against great powers like Britain, Russia, or Austria. This is why puppeting large nations like Mexico is important. Alongside that, puppets pay us taxes, and we can use those taxes to support a more effective army and spend more on construction. On the other hand, puppets come with one major downside which we'll look at a bit later, but it involves a lot of wasted time. Mexico is of particular importance because you want to get them before America does. America is a waking giant of a power which, if not stopped quickly, will grow to be much tougher. It also makes invasions into America easier if you have Mexico, since you have at least one land front on them, instead of just naval invasions. Beating Mexico is obviously quite easy as France, and that's how the vast majority of the wars will go. In this war, Central America joined, and if I had an interest in Central America, I'd have added war goals to take land from them. There are two schools of thought you can go down in these early parts of the run. You can either immediately go back to max infamy by attacking large minor powers like Mexico, as I've done, or you can try to fly under the radar and attack small guys. I'm not sure which strategy is better honestly, as I haven't done massively extensive testing for this. As examples of small powers to crush early on, consider Arabia, which I chose as my stomping ground of choice. These wars aren't very meaningful in terms of the development of my nation, but any nation we can mark off the list is useful. I went for Mara, and a very opportune intervention from the Trucial States came up. This is really good because Britain would normally protect the small Bedouin nation. This way we can add a war goal to take down the Trucial States during a war with Mara, and take off two nations from our checklist in one diplomatic play. That saves 100 days of waiting for the diplomatic play to escalate. Anyway, the other setup for the world conquest is to just spam barracks back home. We'll be slowly assembling a larger army since more soldiers means faster war victories. You don't necessarily need them to be able to win wars, since with our shrapnel artillery and massive numbers we probably can defeat all the great powers at once. This is about speed. In terms of my path, I kept conquering off in Arabia while the Prussians and Austrians fought for German leadership. We actually do want Germany to unify because then we can conquer them in one go. A war with a big Germany might sound like it'll take a long time, but not as long as individually attacking each of the tiny German kingdoms, duchies, and counties. The wars in Arabia were entirely uneventful until I attacked the Khazimids and Russia intervened. These interventions are actually extremely important to being speedy because we can spend our maneuvers adding war goals to Russia. Once again, I must emphasize how important it is to be economical with your diplomatic plays due to the 100 day minimum. Against Russia, I'm going to liberate Finland because if I transfer them there would be a personal union, which would require two diplomatic plays to annex, whereas with liberation I can annex them directly in just one diplomatic play. I'm also going to liberate Ukraine and Kazan, just because that will dent the Russian power base a bit, and we'll do shenanigans with state isolation later. Regardless of how your game is going, these are the principles by which World Conquest works in Victoria 3. It's all about the diplomatic play economics. The opening plays as France you can make, whether you are going for a World Conquest or not, are great, since you can just instantly forget all the infamy, and crippling Britain without any interference because of how declared interest works means it's extremely easy to dominate as France. Let's get more into exactly how my run went, and some of the mistakes I made in my run, and how you can avoid them. The great powers of the game are Britain, Russia, Prussia, Austria, the United States, and honorarily the Great Qing. Though technically not a great power, they are effectively one in terms of the effort to conquer them that you'll have to put in. When it comes to Britain, they're actually one of the easiest powers to take down since their capital is so exposed, especially when you use your opening move to cripple them so strongly. Destroying a great power is more about destroying their prestige than their actual land, and there are a couple of ways to do that permanently, and a couple ways to do it temporarily. When you conquer land from someone, they lose prestige because of the GDP loss, and whatever barracks they had there are gone. This could be considered a permanent loss. When you humiliate an opponent, or open their market, or ban slavery in their country, they lose 25% of their prestige as a decaying modifier. These do stack, so you can, in theory, cut a nation's prestige by 75%, but this prestige loss is temporary. I find that it's better to just continuously conquer states rather than to strategically reduce prestige temporarily and then to go for a puppet play, simply because it can be difficult to pull in a power against you during that modifier's time, especially since humiliations prevent the opponent from fighting against you anyway. For that reason, I recommend just liberating big countries like Ukraine, and once that's done, conquer states directly in order of GDP percentage, if you're willing to check. When you liberate countries, if they're too big to take all the states in one war, but still a minor power, then puppet them. Otherwise, conquer them. Ukraine would be an example of a country which is too big to just outright conquer, so you'd want to puppet them if they're a minor power. Ukraine sometimes bankrupts and enters minor power status, but everyone's game will be different, so make a judgement call on that. Britain is in the unique position of mostly deriving its prestige from its subjects. You're going to want to yoink the Canadas and Australias from them once you've conquered most of Britain itself. 
I knew this kind of, but I didn't check the math until later on in my runs. So I didn't realize exactly how much prestige these subjects give to Britain. You're much better off spending your maneuvers on conquering everything in Britain except Ireland and then focusing on their subjects. Obviously India is first pick, but if you're following this guide, it will have been the first subject you stole right from the outset. Britain is definitely the first great power you'll want to neuter because they can colonize pretty quickly and that makes them take even longer to get rid of. It's not a massive rush, but it is in your best interest to eradicate Britain as they'll only grow stronger over time. Powers like Russia and Qing are your lowest priorities since they tend to stagnate, although sometimes Russia will just completely snowball into an immense power. Keep an eye on the AI's GDP lines, since those are a general indicator of the AI's success. Of course, if any nation seems to be building up momentum, then you want to bring them down before that gets out of hand. Back in my run here, I've released Ukraine and Kazan from Russia, and I'm back to attacking smaller nations in the Middle East while I build up some more economy. I'm building lots of basic materials like iron and coal, and getting a solid set of steel and railways up. The economy building in this game isn't all that complicated, just build in tiers. Work up from resources into manufacturing goods, into consumer goods. Manufacturing goods are stuff like steel and tools, while consumer goods are final products like clothes and furniture. You can throw in agriculture here and there, but frankly, you've got India, so grain isn't much of a need anymore. What you'll want agriculture for is stuff like dyes and silk for your clothes or opium for your armies. In 1848, I attacked Greater Manchester again, taking what remained of England and puppeting Portugal since they are part of the war anyway. I'm also grabbing some small states just because they're low maneuver cost and I'm out of maneuvers for a proper big state. It was a bit of a long war with the Manchesterites capitulating in 1850. They became Great Britain again at that point, ending Manchester's supremacy in the British Isles for good. Next up is a pretty important tactic. I noticed that Belgium and Britain had a defensive pact, so I can attack Belgium to once again fight Britain. I am conquering Belgium in this war, since they're another country to get through, but I'm using most of my maneuvers to attack Britain. If you see opportunities to dogpile on opponents by attacking people they're sworn to defend, or just attacking opponents you know they're likely to defend, then do it and keep the pressure on the great powers. With your maxed out infamy, everyone will be chomping at the bit to fight you, so it's quite likely they will. We don't want too many powers always joining wars and slowing things down, so there's a balance to be struck, but ultimately, getting around truce is to keep great powers down by attacking nations they feel obligated to defend is smart. At the same time as my war with Britain, I was lucky enough to be attacked by the Ottomans. In the case of World Conquest, being attacked is great because it can happen during other diplomatic plays allowing you to access more simultaneous wars. Against the Ottomans, I demanded a transfer of Tripolitania, and then the Americans joined the war. I'm going to liberate New Africa from the Americans. I added a conquest for Diyarbakir and Ankara, with war operations from both enemies to top it off. A war with Belgium was coming to a close at the same time. The war went very smoothly, except for one unexplained occurrence. I'm not sure why, but when the war ended, I simply was not given the Arbeck here, despite the Ottomans capitulating. It just wasn't ticked at their capitulation, and I have no idea why. I tried save scumming to see if it was just some random bug, but it kept happening, even with a manual peace deal, so yeah, no idea. Now I've got this isolated Ankara state just sitting there. Moving on, I'm going to make more moves against smaller targets while I'm waiting for truces. I started off with Sindh and the Sikh Empire, after which I went for Qing. Qing is an interesting target because they often fall under the influence of Russia. This can kind of suck since it makes the wars take longer and it means you'll waste more time. It also can mean that you can stack war goals against both at the same time and work them down simultaneously if you want. I chose to split my attention between the two and I had a trick up my sleeve for pulling Russia down into the dumps. I'm going to grab the Greater Caucasus and Alaska for now alongside some high value Chinese states. My plan is to cut off Western Russia from Central and Eastern Russia by conquering every available port that connects Russia's market capital in St. Petersburg to the rest of the country. Unfortunately though, due to some very janky AI exclusive abilities, Russia has Qing in their market. It's not normally possible to get Qing into your market since they are always considered too large to be a subject, but somehow the customs union on them is allowed, but not for the player, naturally. This means I can't really cut off Russia's market. In your run, if Russia doesn't have Qing in its market, you can conquer the eastern ports in Kamchatka and Chukotka and take Georgia to cut off all ports. Then you take Arkhangelsk and whatever other states connect Russia to Central Asia. And I'm still going to pull it off, but later rather than now. It is possible to pull off quite early if you can be fast enough. Anyway, wars with Qing will always take a long time due to how massive the country is, and the same applies to Russia. The saving grace is that both nations tend to take heavy casualties due to their low quality armies, and therefore gain war exhaustion faster than you'd think. The war ended in 1856, while Scottish separatists were working to escape my nation, with Prussia's help. Afterwards, the Kashmiris also rose up, but I put everyone down with ease. These rebellions are only bad because they waste time. They have no chance of action going anywhere. Britain was on the chopping block next. This time I'm taking the Canadas and Wales alongside Gambia and Mozambique. Naturally, the Americans intervened and I defeated them, 
But unfortunately that bug from before with the war goals happened, and I was not given control of Lower Canada. I have no explanation for this, I guess consider it a RNG hard mode. Next up is Ukraine since they bankrupted recently and are now a minor power. Moldavia is joining the war so I'll be conquering them as a bonus point, as goes for Kazan who also joined the war. Lastly, the Ottomans joined the war and I chose to just take the Arbeck here, which should have been mine in the first place frankly, but whatever. The war went without a hitch and ended right at the end of 1859. Apparently I didn't get to stay at war with Kazan as our war just ended without any notification after Ukraine and the Ottomans capitulated, but we had no truce so I just started another play against them immediately. It was also at this time that the German Empire was formed by Austria. Normally this is a good thing since it consolidates all those tiny German minor nations into one big country we can conquer in fewer diplomatic plays, but Austria somehow formed Germany and didn't integrate most of the small nations. Oof size large. Against Germany, who I attack next of course, I'll be taking my claimed states first of all. The Rhineland and North Rhine followed by liberating Prussia and Hungary, tacking on Ruhr as an extra insult to injury. Using my land connection to Vienna through Moldavia and naval invading into Croatia and Italy, I was able to create enough fronts to shake up Germany enough so that they would eventually fall to me. An Austrian formed Germany is scary because Vienna is difficult to reach compared to Berlin, but it certainly can be done. I got on my war goals in 1862. The strategy with Germany is to hope they actually form and when they do, release big tags like Hungary and Croatia, and if available, Prussia, so you can puppet them. Beyond them, conquering states individually works great. You'll see later on that carving a path straight down the middle of Germany works pretty well, since Germany is composed of a relatively small number of high value states. You can take them down to minor power pretty quickly. Moving on, I attacked the Netherlands and Luxembourg, as at this point I'm just going for my claims, and after that war, it was time to attack Russia. It's 1864 by this point and I've hamstrung all the great powers, which spells impending success for the run. I'm going to shift away from the focus on great powers to talk a bit about some of the mistakes and downfalls I made and the ones you could be making. It's important not to lose your focus on the way to world conquest. There are two time losses that will set you back heavily and those are subject civil wars and separatists. Subject civil wars are more common but less damaging due to one peculiar detail about them. During a subject civil war diplomatic play, 100 days must pass as usual, but during the 100 day diplomatic play, you can still start another diplomatic play since the play is considered to be a play between the subject and its rebels, which you've stepped into, rather than being a play you are now leading or targeted by. The same cannot be said for separatists who do declare war directly on you. Separatists are entirely RNG based with a very low percentage chance to attempt a separation every week while their turmoil is over 50%. Since it's entirely random, you might think you have no control, but in reality you do. Radicals cause turmoil, and radicals are caused by losses in standard of living. For that reason, maintaining a strong consumer economy is actually central to a world conquest. If you can have lots of cheap clothes, food, furniture, and services for your pops, then they'll quickly gain standard of living, which will eradicate their issues with standard of living. You can wipe out turmoil in a state pretty fast if they're a relatively poor state that is then moved into your prosperous market. This leads me into the third potential mistake you could be making, which would be to ignore your economy and market. The market remains important throughout the entire game due to the turmoil issue. Your country can and will erupt into secession upon secession and civil wars if you don't keep your economy going. Remember that as you conquer more opponents your population will go up, and with it the demand for all those goods. It is quite unlikely that the states you're conquering will be producing enough clothes or anything to be keeping up with their own demands, so you'll have to make up those market gaps. Another way to ensure you have less turmoil is to always keep your legitimacy high and your taxes low. Radicals can easily kill a world conquest and legitimacy does give you some loyalists. It gives fewer than it once did, but it still does. Going back to subjects, which I mentioned earlier, this is an interesting dilemma. You want to keep conquering your enemies so you can get them off the checklist, but you also don't want to be dealing with the inevitable civil wars your subjects will go through. You can choose to annex your puppets as soon as possible, but then you'll have a bunch of radicals since annexations are considered conquests, and at the same time, your puppets already had access to your market, so it's much more difficult to inflate their standard of living from their pre-conquest levels to get rid of subsequent turmoil. I'm mixed on this issue. In this particular attempt, I chose to pretty much never annex puppets so that I could avoid dealing with their radicals, which did cost me some time due to civil wars here and there. I'd have to do more attempts where I try each strategy to be sure, but I think I prefer keeping puppets for their income as well, and most of all, as the fact that they create more fronts against your enemy. More fronts will always accelerate wars. In terms of other advice, I'd recommend working on your military tech constantly so you can get down to tank battalions, airplanes, and infiltrators. Those units add provinces captured in battles, which will again accelerate your wars. I'd even recommend skipping out with trench infantry because they'll only slow you down. 
There shouldn't be any nations that can stand a chance against your skirmish infantry, although you find yourself often barely winning battles, consider switching. The loss of provinces captured can be offset by the faster won battles. This leads me to my next bit of advice for taking on larger nations. Always be naval invading. I often neglect this out of laziness or just plain forgetfulness, but every front you create is another battle that can be fought. More battles mean more casualties and more provinces taken over time. If you can create fronts that have no defenders, you can push through enemy provinces with immense speed. The difference in speed between even just one battalion defending and zero is massive. Make those zero defender fronts happen as often as possible, wherever possible. Even if you can't, naval invasions are another pseudo front. They create casualties via naval battles and via ground battles on the actual landing itself. They also can take provinces for free if no one is defending. Another bit of advice I'd give is with regards to colonization. If we follow EU4 rules, we don't technically need all the uncolonized land to call us to world conquest, but I think it's much easier to get all the uncolonized land in this game than that one, so it's easy to tack on. That, and snatching up colonies before others can, is actually important for keeping them weak. We don't want Britain to colonize a ton and end up being a longer slog to take down. The advice I give about colonizing is that you don't necessarily need malaria prevention to colonize in heavy malaria regions. Assuming that every European heritage state that you conquer, you incorporate, you can get a pretty massive incorporated population. This metric is what determines your colonization speed. Obviously, the 95% reduction in speed due to malaria is painful, but you can still get a province every 2-300 to days with how massive your population is. The reason it can be helpful is that you can grab up coastlines quickly enough to stop others from starting any colonies. Another thing about colonies is you don't necessarily need to spend a ton of bureaucracy on max level colonial affairs once you do have malaria prevention. Colonization is limited to 2% per day, no matter how much colonization you generate. For that reason, if you are generating something like 16%, that extra 14 is just going to waste. Start reducing your colonial affairs stuff once you hit that point to save on bureaucracy. Bureaucracy itself is, thankfully, a relatively self-solving issue, as you get more from the government administrations you're conquering from others. That being said, if you get multiculturalism at any point, you'll suddenly have a ton of immigrants coming to metropolitan France, which happens to me in my game. This will heavily tank your bureaucracy since your institutions will cost more when more pops move into your incorporated states. Back to radicals, I highly recommend either technocracy or oligarchy since maintaining high legitimacy with those distributions of power is very easy. You can try going for a universal suffrage system, but early on the battle between liberal and conservative groups will always keep your legitimacy low. It's not until you can get the surge of socialism that you can start killing off conservative clout and replace it with liberal leftist coalition parties. Legitimacy can be gained by conquering Beijing for the Forbidden Palace by the way, which does help. Using clonal exploitation, you can get 22 more legitimacy from it, although I believe there's an upcoming patch that will change how clonal exploitation works, so this may no longer be valid soon. From here, I'm going to skip the run to 1906 to show you how things have gone so far. First of all, notice that off in India, the East India Company's annexed all of its lower princes. This is really useful for getting through all those princes without any diplomatic plays. I want to show off a war with Finland I had in 1908 as an example of something that can go wrong sometimes. I'm fighting to conquer Finland here, and I've got all their states as war goals. This should be easy enough, but unfortunately they had a civil war mid-war. This removes your war goals without refunding infamy by the way, and it'll make you have to do another diplomatic play later after the truce. It's very hard to predict if an AI will have a civil war, but one hint can be by checking the politics section for political movements that have high radicalism. If you see a nation with an incoming political movement at more than 80 or so radicalism, just don't fight them until that goes away. You might still get wrecked by separatists, but you can at least mitigate the chances that anything happens by doing this little check. I never thought to do it until after this run when reflecting on my mistakes. That's all the advice I can think of. There likely is more to improve on, but these are the big things I can think of. Feel free to comment below some of your own advice you might have as I'm always looking to improve my play. The last section of this video will be an overview of my late game, which I consider to be 1910 and beyond. The year is 1916. I've got 20 years left to conquer just a little bit more land. The only problem is that little bit of land is held by many independent nations and I keep having subject civil wars and separatists to deal with. I'm working on taking down Indonesia, as I'm or with Perak. Unfortunately, even tiny single state nations like Perak can have civil wars, and they did mid-war, so that was a huge pain. I'll have to waste another play on them. This is where something really weird happened. My Dominion, the East India Company, joined the Perak civil war on the side of regular Perak, who I'm currently fighting. I then conquered Perak, and the civil war and my war ended abruptly. This created the weird scenario, where the EICU was still in a diplomatic play against the new Parak, who previously was the rebelling Parak. There are no war goals on either side, by the way. The moment the war broke out, the EIC became independent, and I have no idea why. This definitely upset me because it felt like a bug or something. There's nothing I can do to stop it, 
and it won't be too much of a pain to fix, as the EIC will, without my market, descend into bankruptcy and civil wars that will cut their prestige and absolutely puppet them. But just, why is Victoria like this? It always upsets me a lot when these extremely major bugs get in the way of things so much. I got stuck in the Civil War loop from 1917 to 1919, unfortunately, which again speaks to the trouble with too many puppets, but I did eventually break free and go conquer Algeria. Luckily, all the Barbary states joined the war, so I could take all of them in one war. At this point in the run, by the way, this game is running so slowly, it's absolutely intolerable. To give an idea of how slow things are, the time it took to move from 1920 to 1921 was 40 real-life minutes. To be clear, about 90% of that time was speed 5 no pause. Here and there, I'd pause to set up fronts or do some buildings, but it was almost all just time passing. I got Bengal back in 1921, and then conquered Kiva and Bukhara, followed by completing the Finland conquest after the unfortunate civil war from before. It's now 1923, and I'm conquering Bhutan and putting down a Chinese rebellion, and this is when I was starting to run out of steam. You see, I have an idea of whether or not I'm going fast enough to complete the run, and looking at the Great Lakes region, which I haven't even started yet, I have to get very lucky with many Ugandan and Rwandan nations coming together to fight me in just a handful of diplomatic plays to make this work, and the game was running so slowly. From 1921 to 1923 was an hour and a half. I've already been playing this run for around 10 or so hours to get here, and to finish the last decade and a half will take another 10 or so hours to make happen, and quite frankly, I've got a France World Conquest guide to make. On December 31st, 1923, I ended the run, even though the world was not yet conquered. The world is, for all intents and purposes, conquered, but it isn't quite done. There are only insignificant powers left in the world, as every minor power has been conquered. I took some time to look around in other map modes because we all love studying up on cool map modes I assume, and then I stopped. Now the real question whether or not a world conquest is possible. I do believe it is possible, it's just something which will require a bit of luck and nearly perfect play. One thing that could be pivotal to pulling off the run could be safe scumming every native uprising and secession, since those are a percentage chance RNG event that can be stopped by reloading. The problem is that you'd have to be doing that quite a lot, and it can't be used to stop puppet civil wars which were the far more common time waster in the run. Well. This is my friend's run 923. As you can see, it's not just a world conquest, it's also a pretty damn impressive run in terms of standard of living and GDP given my immense size. Obviously, if I were more focused, I could have worked harder to get my GDP up there, although I'm pretty happy with 3.5 billion. I'm actually quite proud of a 17.5 standard of living with an almost 700 million population nation. Looking around for any interesting migration patterns, we can see some heavy Han migration into Africa, and some French dominance in Arizona and Utah, but besides that, pretty normal looking culture map mode. Turkish migrants have completely settled Bulgaria and much of Greece too. In terms of standard of living, metropolitan France is a huge sea of green with lighter green across the French market and immense red in eastern China. That's because I used China as an agriculture sector and that destroyed their arable land. Without arable land, there are millions of unemployed pops who otherwise would have been peasants. Of course, the issue of Victoria 3 presenting colonized Africa as a prosperous land after being exploited is unfortunate, but it is what it is. I guess Victoria believes in the Africa would still just be huts without European intervention, sort of white man's burden type of colonization. Very base paradox. GDP wise, most of my GDP is focused in France and Bohemia, with nations like Hungary and Canada having thrived under my market, but most of my puppets have just kind of stagnated. Alright, that's all for the France guide. In case it wasn't obvious, France is immensely powerful, and certainly the best candidate for world conquests. I couldn't pull it off here due to a few cascading mistakes and a lack of patience to finish the run, but I'm still quite happy with this run. I hope your France runs go even better. I hope you don't feel deceived by the video, since I didn't actually complete the World Conquest. I do so consider this a capable guide to World Conquest, I just can't bother to try another 20 or so hour run just to prove it can be done. Thank you for your time.